I'm Marty Leon, and I'd like to welcome you to the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, where we're having a very engaging discussion about an exciting new technology in the space of transcatheter aortic valve replacement. We're talking about the biomimetic Duravar THV, studying the clinical impact of restoring native flow. We have an outstanding panel, which I'll briefly introduce, Brian Lindman. Um, from Vanderbilt University, Yoshi Kaneko from Washington University in St. Louis, and Jeff Potma uh, from Harvard Medical School and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, our Chief Scientific Officer. We spent a fair amount of time discussing the importance of and some of the differences among different valve systems with respect to flow dynamics. Not something that the clinician tends to focus on, but in the modern era of how we're treating younger um, uh, and less sick patients, but the expectation of a longer um, lifespan of bioprosthetic valves, some of these subtleties may assume much greater significance. Um, now with understanding a little bit about the flow dynamics, we want to focus on the potential impact of laminar flow in AS outcomes. So um, let's start with asking um, uh, 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 Yoshi to talk a little bit about why we're looking at the myocardium to make decisions about intervention at the valve level. Um, w w we have often focused on just the hemodynamics of a valve, but we're now beginning to address in a much different way that the, the, the uh, um, uh, downstream and upstream effects of that hemodynamic um, abnormality can be deleterious to patients. And let's talk a little bit about the myocardium. Yeah, and I think surgeons have historically known this. Uh, when the patient comes in too late, we see patients with significantly diminished LV function in addition to RV function and pulmonary hypertension. We have seen those patients, we've operated on those patients, and those outcomes were very bad. Um, I think that has been more strategically categorized um, by the cardiology team after the expansion of TAVR um, into a concept of cardiac damage. And there is a concept of that cardiac damage progressing as the disease progresses. And can we catch that at the early stage? Um, I think that intervention timing becomes very, very important. What's your thought on this, Jeff? Well, it becomes critically important because think where we are right now with early TAVR and with the ongoing trials of progress and expand two, it's gonna be very tricky because we're trying to figure out how we intervene in what is typically not in the guidelines. Guidelines, it's severe aortic stenosis. It's not in the guidelines in terms of intervening early. It is now with the asymptomatics, but certainly in terms of hitting things at the moderate stage. And we'll know in the next couple of years exactly whether that's important or not. And that's really for two, for two reasons. One is we need to understand valve performance, knowing whether it's better due to early before the cardiac damage has occurred. And General has done a very nice job putting all that together in terms of quantified um, uh, metrics and stages. But I gotta say that if we're starting to intervene earlier, then we gotta think more about the valve performance in the long term as well. Because it's really gonna be a question for the earlier patient that would normally be getting cardiac damage but not have the valve replacement. Now we're replacing it early and now we've got a longer horizon for that patient in the future. What do you think about intervention? Yeah, I mean, as we think more about, you know, as the myocardium goes, so goes the patient. Um, we need to think more about how to protect uh, the myocardium and to help it to recover after being on, you know, the valve replacement unloads the heart. And so issues of optimal timing to prevent irreversible damage to the myocardium becomes important. Um, but also valve performance in terms of, you know, optimal unloading of the heart. Um, and, and insofar as that happens at the valvular level and you know, downstream in terms of the vasculature, maximal unloading will help there to be recovery uh, and regression of maladaptive remodeling. And uh, of course, intervening sooner does bring up these issues of, of durability uh, and, and making sure that that's optimized as well. So a lot of things to optimize uh, at the valve level as we think about the myocardium. And I think that's really what we've learned some our randomized trials versus surgery is that we're looking now for 10 years mm -hmm. of valve performance. Patients are older, so they're not gonna get to the finish line quite so often. Mm -hmm. Younger patients in our low-risk trials, both from Partner 3 and from Evolute, more patients I think are getting lost to the finish line. 10-year outcomes are gonna be important. 
And that's where we're really going to start to differentiate some of these, at least in terms of TAVR versus, versus surgery. You know, I hope in the future that we redefine what aortic stenosis is. We've always thought of it, or we typically think of it as something that occurs at the valve level. Um, and we talk about the severity of the hemodynamic lesion as being the principal issue in terms of defining um, what stage the disease is in and whether or not you should intervene. I think what we're learning is that this concept of cardiac damage and however you define it um, indicates that um, left ventricular hypertrophy, which we describe as compensatory, compensatory is not good. Compensatory is bad. It's maladaptive, it's deleterious, and it puts strain on the entire cardiac system. And from LVH, you end up with left atrial dilatation, you end up with pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation, RV dysfunction, RV failure, and by then, the game is lost. So identifying some of these changes in the state of the cardiac physiology beyond the valve, I think is extremely important because it helps to characterize the disease state as not just a unitary phenomenon at the valve level, but something that's much more complex than that. So I feel in the future, we have to stage patients and not just describe right. the severity right. at right. the valve level, right. um, because that's really how we're gonna be directing our therapy. Because yeah. many, you know, patients respond to a given degree of valve obstruction differently. Exactly. And so a valve area of 1.2 in many patients, perfectly fine. Their ventricle's mm -hmm. not hypertrophy, there's not fibrosis, there's good function. Whereas there are other patients that we see, 1.2, and their heart is, you know, markedly hypertrophied. The ECV is, you know, really high. Uh, and some of these, dam these, these, these uh, phenomena are becoming irreversible. And so there needs to be a much more nuanced approach to thinking about you know, timing and tailoring and personalizing as to when we should be you know, unloading the heart. But that brings up an important point maybe you can address a little bit more is that we don't really think about remodeling as one of the tools that we look and say the patient's doing better. The symptoms are better, they're feeling better, they get more active, but what are some of the benefits of reverse remodeling, if you will? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to be learned here. I, I think we, uh, through the partner studies, were able to make, a, I think, a seminal observation in the largest cohort to look at this to say that regression of LV mass at one year is associated with clinical outcomes, meaningful clinical outcomes in terms of um, uh, greater regression, less mortality, less rehospitalization, better quality of life. But, but it's not just, you know, I mean, there's a lot in that mass, and, and there's a lot, a lot of other things going on, much of which haven't been as well studied. And so there's issues of fibrosis regression, um, there's issues of, um, you know, less myocardial oxygen demand, uh, myocardial flow reserve in the microvasculature. These are all concepts that we need to better understand in terms of, uh, you know, what it looks like to optimally recover and unload uh, from a valve replacement and how that might yield better outcomes, freedom from heart failure down the road. And as we think about intervening on younger patients, these issues in terms of how they play out, out over time are really important. And, and I, I, I kind of thinking now back on the patient with the low gradient, low output, preserved ejection fraction and the importance of the myocardium in that circumstance. You ever think some of the patients we get to, we get to too late, and they're not going to not going to be able to reverse? I mean, absolutely. Uh, um, you know, we'll get into it in another part of our, our our series here. But but there are patients who, you know, had moderate or severe LVH uh, prior to their TAVR, and one year out, 39% of them still had severe left ventricular hypertrophy. So although on average regression occurs, there are many patients that don't experience it. And that is clinically meaningful uh, in terms of you know, increased mortality and rehospitalization. You know, Brian has written one of the seminal papers really to understand that even though we talk about LVH regression, we talk about how well patients do after we do an AVR, either surgical or transcatheter, we don't talk much about the non-responders. Right. Right. Um, we give mean figures, but we don't talk about the non-responders. That population is significant, and in the very symptomatic, higher risk patients, up to 50% of the patients fell into a category of what any reasonable clinician would describe as a non-responder. Mm -hmm. 
where symptoms persisted, where they had repeat hospitalizations, where they had recurrent heart failure, and this is after a successful AVR. So we are obviously treating patients too late. And in the early TAVR study, we just saw some of the more recent data looking um, um, at the state of cardiac disease in these asymptomatic severe AS patients, and two-thirds had more than stage two, quote, cardiac damage, which meant LVHN more even before they were treated. And these are asymptomatic patients. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think it points to taking a much more holistic approach and nuanced approach to thinking about how do we mitigate that adverse remodeling, either by intervening sooner, medical therapy, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. adjunctive therapy, but also thinking about unloading of the heart optimally and, and the impact that the valve and its performance and characteristics may have on that. I think we've had a lot of discussion about laminar flow, how it might be unique with certain designs, but how do we put that into clinical practice? What can we say to clinicians yeah. about the effect of this laminar flow right. on how mass regression occurs over time? What, what do we know about that? When we're talking about the Duravar valve, I think we have to go back to the design of the valve itself. Um, it is a single piece valve. It's a mono, mono leaflet valve that is molded into the shape of a healthy valve. And by doing that, hence called biomimetic valve, I think that is where the restoration, restoration of the physiologic flow occurs. So this is, the, uh, this is the MRI compared to the baseline when the patient had the disease to six months. You can see that before there was a turbulent flow that was seen um, on, the, on the MRI, which is completely resolved at six months. You see that beautiful laminar flow, um, which is very uniform in that six months MRI. So there is a restoration of the laminar flow, and therefore that may lead to normalization of the LV mass. Um, that flow definitely puts that afterload to that LV. And does that have an effect in the LV mass? And by relieving that, can the LV mass regress? And we have some early data to show that. And this is looking at some of the, uh, some of the data comparing the pre-intervention versus the post-Duravar implant in 15 patients. And there was a 22% decrease in the LV mass that was seen. And more interestingly, when they compare it to the healthy individuals of 20 patients, the LV mass was very similar to patients who were completely healthy versus the patient who got treated with Duravar. And the hypothesis behind this is that normal flow restoration leads to this. Incredibly important. Marty, you were so eloquent in terms of how you put this um, statement that maybe we're treating people too late. Maybe you could summarize what we've talked about in this session and, and really the take home concepts for our clinicians is, gosh, we, we gotta have data, number one, and accumulation data and early TAVR gets us there, but maybe as clinicians we have to start thinking about a broader picture of what aortic stenosis constitutes. And, and then something like a valve that actually gets back to normal flow might be important. No, Jeff, I think we're learning a lot and I think that some of the new studies are gonna educate us further. I think some of the points Brian made about uh, treating every patient as an, as an individual patient with a particular pathophysiology and a reaction to hemodynamic stress in different ways um, is going to be critically important. I can envision a time when uh, we're going to have a, a high quality echocardiogram that's been taken and read using AI techniques that'll spit out, I don't know, 10 or 20 different characteristics that will define a patient's risk strata and how we should be managing them in terms of the timing of the intervention, concomitant medications, and a variety of other things. And that timing is not too far in, you know, in the future. I think we're getting closer to that point uh, because th this is a continuous disease and the way we've had these dichotomous categories of severe, moderate, um, mild aortic stenosis uh, doesn't make reasonable sense anymore and I think we've got to think beyond that. Um, so we're trying very hard uh, to become more sophisticated. Um, uh, we need more data and I think we're generating more data but we uh, even at this point recognize that there are differences among the therapies that we apply um, uh, from the standpoint of how they affect um, uh, laminar flow across the aorta and the impact of that on LV function and LV uh, um, uh, stress. Uh, there are differences in terms of the patient response, and we need to understand that better in terms of 
um, uh, our timing of how we intervene in these patients, uh, either earlier or later. Um, and there are going to be differences in terms of the uh, timing of recovery after AVR. LVH doesn't go away the day you put a valve in. I mean, we've seen mass regression continue out. In, in, in fact, it begins to peak after about 18 or 24 months. Mm -hmm. So it may be that if you had a valve that restored laminar flow immediately, that the rate of change in LV regression would be very different and quicker, and that may have important clinical implications. So all of these things, I think, are going to be incorporated in some of the next generation clinical trials that we're planning right now with new systems like the Duravar THV. Great. Good. All right. Well, I think that that'll put, that'll put a close to, to this session. I think next session we'll talk a little bit more about clinical outcomes. But this has been always um, incredibly provocative discussion, so thank you.